Hi, my name is Naomi Bedapudi, and I'm introducing Eliza Lawhead. The other day, I was sitting just a couple feet away in the chapel pews, listening to the organ as Day by Day played. And I say I was listening to the organ specifically because to my surprise, no one was singing Day by Day. Not a single soul. It was pure silence. But then, like the chorus of angels rang out to the shepherds, a voice appeared. It was just like an angel. Her voice made me cry. And to no one's surprise, this ethereal voice was Eliza Lawhead's. To all the poor, unfortunate souls who haven't heard Eliza's voice, either when she sings in chamber or in the numerous musicals she's been in, I would tell you two things. One, you're clearly missing out. And two, you have to go listen to her sing. I wish I had more time to tell you about Eliza because more than just her voice and her mastery of lip sync battles, she's genuinely one of the coolest, funniest, most amazing people I've had the pleasure of meeting. So, just like an audience prepares themselves for a concert, sit up straight and pay attention to one of the most talented people you'll ever hear, Eliza Gray Lawhead. <laughs> One second. <laughs> I have a cold, so it's gonna sound a little weird. Okay. I bet that most of us have probably looked up something along the lines of, why is my chest tight and my heart racing? Or why is there a weird red bump on my arm? And WebMD popped up telling you that you might have this really rare disease that you can't pronounce. While this is my current go-to method for these moments, when I was younger, I used a slightly different digital doctor to diagnose myself. I had an iPad when I was around six or seven, but I was not quite literate, literate enough to know how to type on it, uh, so I always resorted to using Siri. Something quite important to note is that I also had a speech impediment at this age uh, where I would pronounce my L's as R's. Uh, I have thankfully grown out of it, but it humorously, yet unfortunately, did affect a few aspects of my life, particularly voice-activated technology, especially ones that think you're talking to them when you aren't, but don't think you're talking to them when you actually want to. <sighs> Siri. Uh, one day, though I am, I'm not sure why, a thought suddenly popped into my head, and I realized I needed to sort something out. Instead of asking my licensed doctor about my concerns, I, I would ask Siri numerous things like, Symptoms of cancer, how do you know if you have cancer, how do you get cancer, and straight up just, do I have cancer? Circling back to the said speech impediment, each time I asked my trusted doctor, Siri, anything about cancer, she thought I was saying cancel and would close out. Seven-year-old me did not vibe with this, and I thought that it meant I had, I had it, and Siri was just too afraid to break the news to me. With Siri's diagnosis that I had only found out through her fearful silence, I thought everything was a symptom of the potential illness. One night, I walked upstairs to my bedroom, and I ended up incredibly winded with my heart pounding. And I knew what I had to do. So I ran downstairs to break the difficult news to my dad and stepmom. Unfortunately, they did not believe the urgent report of my new self-diagnosis and told me to go back to bed. However, they did not realize that I was also very paranoid about a handful of other things, specifically regarding bedtime. Uh, each night before bed, I would make sure that every item I would take with me if something disastrous happened, disastrous as in tornadoes, which are still one of my biggest fears, was easily accessible so I could grab my precious valuables, my blankie and aforementioned iPad, and run. I am not really sure where I planned to run since we didn't have a basement, but, I mean, at least I had the spirit. I mean, coincidentally, my childhood best friends, Kate Wolfcomb, a cool Kate, shared this fear. Kate kept a ladder under her bed that she could throw out of her window as an escape route, and McCool would tie up all of the things he wanted to take with him in an emergency with a rope into a big bundle. And then he would tie the rope around his wrist before he went to bed. Um, <laughs> 
His idea was much more inventive than mine and Kate's, but Kate's was certainly more practical. Um, I'm not quite sure what made us all fear the same thing, but I, I assume it entailed us telling each other about the new da natural disaster we just learned about. Another thing that used to frighten me was toilets. Um, I refused to flush the toilet. <laughs> I thought I was going to fall into the toilet by simply being pulled in by the sheer force of the water and get flushed down like Augustus Gloop getting sucked into the tube from the Chocolate River. <laughs> this habit instilled in me by fear did not please my parents and sister. And I definitely got yelled at it at a few times for it. Um, but luckily, I am no longer paralyzed in fear of Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka and the Oompa Loompas, okay? And might I add, I now flush the toilet. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. On a different note, another fear I had, which makes me wonder how all those worries fit into that tiny little body, is that I would be bitten by a brown recluse or a black widow. Those are both arguably some of the most horrifying things as a child, which petrified us long before we had to face making an appointment on our own, having a really bad hair day, or going to a gathering and not knowing anyone. Um, but notice how most of these things probably won't matter the next day, you know? And they may not even happen. I mean, this has been my mantra for a long time. Since I have generalized anxiety disorder, I worry about a lot of things, a lot. A lot. Uh, but some of those things are out of my control. So there's no point in worrying, because worrying fixes nothing. So I live my life by the idea that most things we stress about will not matter in a maximum of four months and a minimum of a couple minutes. Now, I am not here to trivialize worrying about the truly difficult and serious things that happen to people, but more so things like a singular low test grade or accidentally liking someone's post from two years ago. Uh, sorry. Life is far too short to spend all of your time worrying. This is your one and only life, so do not waste your time stressing over the little things or things that may not even happen. Live your life with no regrets. So when you're nearing the end of your life, you can look back and truly say you loved the life you lived. To conclude, I will share one last thing with you. I believe that the moral of this entire story is something truly meaningful. YOLO. Thank you.